Okay, so what I wanted to go over today is just give you a little more background on the um, ecosystems in the park, and then we can talk a little bit about the presentation assignment that we'll do before we leave on the trip. So here's kind of a rough sort of schematic of how this presentation is broken up, um, where you have factors like topography that we often really don't think about around here very much. There's a handout there, Paige. Um, parent material, which you know is a lot of the geology we'll see in climate, and when those interact all together, you'll get the soils that form, and the soils really dictate the vegetative communities, and that interacts a lot with the wildlife. And then, of course, all that's impacted by natural and human disturbances, and all that changes over time. So, kind of a complex diagram, but just sort of shows all the different aspects of an ecosystem. And so we'll sort of you know, start from the ground and work our way up, basically, looking at all the different aspects of the ecosystems in the Southern Appalachians. And so when you look at the geology, the Southern Appalachians are the biggest mountains east of the Mississippi River, one of the two major mountain changes, chains in uh, the contiguous United States. And uh, they were formed in a few different orogenies or mountain building periods uh, that you can see here in the Permian period. Uh, the Devonian, both in the Paleozoic and the Taconic orogeny in the early uh, Paleozoic there. And what basically happened is, you know, this was 260 to 300 something million years ago. We had a supercontinent and you basically, before the rift opened in the Atlantic Ocean, you had the continental plate that was a large part of Africa pressing into North America. And so that sort of drove the mountain range up. And so this is kind of what a slice of the land would look like today if you went from the Atlantic Ocean over here. Um, you have a coastal plain that's unconsolidated sediment, basically the eroded Appalachian Mountains. And then eventually you hit what we call the fall line, where now you're on the bedrock. Finally, you're not on that unconsolidated coastal plain sediment. And you get up to this first big ridge, and that first big ridge is the Blue Ridge. And that's the highest point, and that's the Appalachian Mountains, basically, where we'll be looking in the Smokies. Behind that, you get into a region called the Ridge and Valley, um, but that's really not what we're focusing on the, in this course. And then behind that, you get into the plateaus. So a conclave this year will be on the Cumberland Plateau, which will be behind the mountains. But it's really interesting when you think about how it happened. So the Southern Appalachian Mountains used to be as high as the Himalayas. So they were five or six miles tall is what we think. Uh, but basically what you have with mountain ranges is you have the continental crust floating on top of the, the mantle. And there's a difference in specific gravity or density between the continental crust and the oceanic crusts. And basically what that causes is the mountains kind of think about an iceberg, right? As it melts, you still have about 10% of it above at all times. So it, you know, as it melts, it takes a long time for it to subside above the water. Well, the mountains kind of work like that. So basically what, you, what happens, it's a concept called uh, isostatic compensation. But if you want to erode one mile off the top of a mountain range, it'll keep lifting back up. So you actually have to erode like five miles of rock. So these mountains used to be five or six miles tall. And so over the last, you know, 300 plus million years, we've really eroded like 25 miles of mountains off the Appalachians. And that forms the coastal plain. So basically half of South Carolina, half of North Carolina, half of Georgia, much of Florida. And so, you know, really that mountain range has really shaped a lot of the Southern US today. And so here's what that kind of looks like on a map or we'll be in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding ecosystems kind of right here. And that's in this Blue Ridge region right here. But pretty much all this land that you see, all that land there, that's eroded Appalachian Mountains. And so that's major cities, Atlanta, Charleston, you know, Charlotte, lots of big cities there. And so this is kind of a cross section of what different layers of rock look like in the Smokies. And there's lots of different types of rock there that really influence the soils and that influences the vegetation, which influences the wildlife. But you can see it's messy, it's complicated. They're all you know squished together, going at different angles, all intermingled. So the geology is pretty complicated in the park. 
And uh, I found uh, a soil guide for the park and it lists uh, a bunch of different sort of areas and they kind of go from high elevation down to low elevation. So we won't go through those in a lot of detail, but what you'll notice is it kind of has the word frigid on, a lot, frigid on a lot of them, then music that's talking about temperature. So it's colder, higher up, cooler, lower down. Basically, if you drop a thousand feet in elevation, it's like moving uh, 250 miles north. Uh, the adiabatic lapse rate or what controls your temperature drop will be about three and a half degrees in human air Fahrenheit. So, you know, as you go lower in elevation, it gets warmer. And so when you look at mean annual soil temperatures in the frigid region there where it's colder, it's from freezing to about 46 degrees Fahrenheit. In the mesic region, 36 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit at some depth. And so I took this photo in Pisgah National Forest right beside the park, and we'll go to Pisgah during one day. This phenomenon is actually called hoarfrost, H-O-A-R, so it's important on this one. Um, but you'll see it form on trees sometimes in the winter, but th this hoarfrost had actually pushed up that rock that's like the size of the palm of your hand, you know, up two or three inches. So, you know, those frigid soils, the freeze-thaw cycle, move all sorts of stuff around, crack big rocks, it does all sorts of stuff. The parent materials in the park are either in residuum, so they're rocks that are weathered in place, or they're colluvium, that's a fancy way of saying rocks that have rolled downhill, um, or alluvium, rocks that have been moved by rivers and streams. And with our residual materials, you learn in the basic geology, right? You have sedimentary rocks, metamorphic and igneous. Igneous is formed from cooling magma. Sedimentary is formed from layers, of sediments piling up. And metamorphic is either sedimentary igneous or other metamorphic rocks that get crushed under heat and pressure for long periods of time. So metamorphosed or changed. And so some of the different rocks that form the soils in the Smokies, the, the residual paramaterials, the sedimentary rocks, there's a lot of limestone, which is calcium carbonate. And so that weathers with rain. The acidity of our rainfall will actually eat away at those rocks. And it causes a really important feature in the Southern Appalachians. It's called karst topography, K-A-R-S-T. And that's just caves. They have lots of caves because the water eats into the rock. And uh, limestone was old like coral beds or you know beds of seashells that got uh, formed into a sedimentary rock. They have a lot of sandstones and those can either be hard or, or soft depending on the cementing material that holds them together. And then they have siltstones. That's when clays are compressed together, basically, or silts. Um, a lot of those rocks are metamorphosed, and so the metamorphosed sandstones are called metasandstones. So that's pretty easy to remember. And then they have lots of other materials there. So if you start with shale, which is mudstone, shale is metamorphosed clays. As it's metamorphosed, it becomes slate, then phyllite, then schist, and then this word, the genus silos. So that's nice. And so some of those gneisses are actually metamorphized from granites as well. And then on the mountains, you'll see lots of stuff rolling downhill off in the meta sandstones who've come down the hill in landslides and whatnot. And then there's lots of streams and creeks and rivers moving stuff around as well. So as we look at those again, now you can kind of see there's those temperature regimes and there's all those parent materials. So except for like mica and a few odds and ends here and there, but you know, you don't have to learn too much to know a lot about the soils in the park. And if you look at some of them, if we start up high, way up in the mountains like that, you'll get soils like this breakneck series. So I think the name of the soil tells you how easy it is to navigate on that terrain, right? Um, this is up on Klingman's Dome, and where it's cold, you get lots of organic matter built. So you can see how dark those soils are. So this is frigid, meaning it's cold, humic, meaning a lot of organic matter. Fissure means there's low base cations, so low calcium, magnesium, things like that. It's been leached out over time. Ude means a eudic moisture regime, so plenty of rainfall, and F means it's an inceptisol. So that's kind of a young soil. A lot of these soils in the park are young because they keep falling down the hill. <laughs> it's hard to form an old soil when the soil keeps falling down the hill. So the units on that tape are centimeters, so you're looking at about a three feet soil pit right there. So still pretty dark throughout. Halfway down the mountains, you often run into what they call colluvial benches. So all the rocks start rolling down the hill, but they always tend to pile up mid slope. They don't make it all the way to the bottom usually. And these benches will tend to get very deep soils often. And so that's where yellow poplar is gonna grow really, really well. We're gonna see a ton of yellow poplar on the trip. 
But some of these soils are pretty rich. There's the Schultowski series, your Poles Gap, which you can see very similar soil taxonomy at the bottom, just not as much organic matter because it's a little warmer. But that would be a really good soil for a tree to grow in, right? Nice deep. If you look, that last one's three feet deep. This one's closer to five feet deep. And then you get all the way to the bottom. Here's Kate's Cove, which is the biggest valley in the park, uh, the biggest area that's not forested in the park, and one of the most popular tourist areas in the park. Gets lots of visitors every year. And there's a Lodon soil series. Now you can see it's an ultasol. We have lots of ultasols here in East Texas, too. You can see it's pretty deep, down to about six feet, and lots of red clay. If you, you know, anybody had soils here yet? Ag or forestry? A few people. So. You've probably ordered a lot of holes of similar looking soils to that. And then there's some others. Uh, I guess if you get really remote here in Lakeview Drive, you can find the Nowhere Soil Series. So, uh, but look at how wet it is. It's an insectosol, but it's aquic. So they have a lot of really wet soils. And then here's the Potomac Series just outside the park. It's an entosol, so it's even younger, flu, wet. And so you can see all the rocks and stones in there. They have lots of soils with lots of rocks and stones in them, so very difficult to dig a hole there. But from a tree standpoint, rocks and stones take away from soil that can be rooted into. So if a soil is real rocky or real stony, you're going to have less overall nutrients for the trees than if that was all soil. So something they keep track of in mountainous regions. So that's just a little bit on soil. I had a lot more the first time I gave this talk, but everyone looked asleep, so i short there. Um, here's a lot of different forest communities. If you look in the syllabus, um, you'll see there are some textbooks for the course, but I've made them all cheap and useful as much as possible. One of the textbooks is a Trails Illustrated map of the park. Uh, we've never had anyone get lost, but if you do get lost, I can say that you were supposed to have a map uh, and a compass. So most of you already have compasses, but um, but you, you can see, I think it's it was $17 a few years ago. Hopefully it's still pretty cheap. Uh, but I've drawn a lot of these forest communities from how that textbook uh, by Tim Spear at Clemson University is structured. And so these are some of the forest communities. Um, I was there, I guess, in June 2020 for a family vacation. And of course, in June 2020, we didn't know if everything was going to stay online or come back face to face or whatever. So I had a 3D camera. So in some of these ecosystems, I've got 3D videos up on YouTube in some of these ecosystems, just talking about them briefly. So. If you're interested, you can go look at those, but the ones I've bolded are ones we can look at just briefly. I showed you all this map last class, but that's just, that's all the different cover types distributed across the park, where you tend to see this pale green, that's the spruce fir up in real high elevation, or sorry, this yellow is the spruce fir up in real high elevations, and the green is northern hardwoods around it, and kind of as you go down in elevations, you get into all sorts of different communities. And what they found in the park is a lot of this was shaped by the glacial history of North America. This is what the biomes and ice cover, there's ice, would have looked like 18,000 years ago in North America. Here's where we are today with no ice except Greenland. Greenland's got ice. But, and so you can see, you know, the trees have moved all around all over the place. The other vegetation and the fauna have moved around all over the place. And so back at this period, you know, the Southern Appalachians would have been right here, mid tide battle. It's like spruce fir up in the boreal forest. Uh, there would have been mountain glaciers. So there would have been glaciers in the mountains back then. And so it would have been, you know, very different looking only 18,000 years ago. So stuff's been changing naturally over thousands and thousands of years in the Southern Appalachians. I'll send you all the slides for this. It may be easier to see them on here, but this is kind of a neat figure they put together uh, based on some research in the park. park. Uh, when you go on the trip, I'll give you a binder and it'll have the publication this was taken from in there too, so you can look at that if you're more interested. Um, it's two panels, but it's really mostly showing one figure. It's just this panel over here has more detail on this section up here, so they've kind of split it apart that way. But from bottom to top, you have elevations, so higher elevations at the top. And then basically in your coves and canyons, it's really wet. Then flats, draws, and ravines are still pretty wet, not as wet. Sheltered slopes are wet. Then as long as we go on open slopes, the north and northeast facing slopes are the wet, the wettest. The south and southwest facing slopes are the driest. And then when you get up on the ridges and peaks, it gets even more dry. So you have a moisture gradient. So there's an elevation gradient, there's a moisture gradient. 
And this research just shows that the poorest communities of the Southern Appalachians and the Smokies, you can really kind of separate them uh, based on elevation and topography. So that's, you know, that's not something we think about at all here in East Texas. So it's kind of a, a totally new wrinkle for us. And then from a wildlife standpoint, the wildlife communities sort of stack up along with those vegetative communities. Um, so at lower elevations, you know, you may have cope hardwood ecosystems with scarlet tanagers and marbled salamanders. And then you'll run into northern hardwood ecosystems and some of the herbs and the birds and other taxa that you find in those will be the same that you would see in like Vermont or, you know, Pennsylvania and similar ecosystems there. And then by the time you get up to the high elevation, um, you may have, you know, cross bills like this, especially at the beaks to get into conifer cones and get those spruce and fir seeds out. Uh, Blue Ridge two-line salamanders, you're only going to find at higher elevations. So you start getting, you know, as we move up or down in elevation in the park, we start getting these distinct vegetative and wildlife communities. And because, you know, if you think about it, you know, most of us have been to Arkansas, the highest mountains in Arkansas are 2,000 something feet, right? Um, and then, you know, what are the high points in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia? They're all going to be right there. <laughs> but pretty low elevation, the high point in Florida is probably like a 200 foot tall landfill or something. But we don't have much elevation here. And so this is where the high elevation is. The mountain's up to 6,000 feet tall. And so if you look at the range map, so here's the black throated green warbler, this pink is the breeding resident. There's a whole bunch of warblers and other tax. I'm just using warblers as, a, as an example where we can drive, you know, 13 hours away and we're basically seeing species that you could find across Canada, the Northeastern US, the Lake States. And so it's kind of this, because of the high elevation, it's kind of like this island of Northern species here in the Southern United States. And so there's the black throated green warbler, black throated blue warbler, and the map is substantially similar there. There's the Black Burnian Warbler, the map is substantially similar there. So you're seeing the effect of the Appalachian Mountains on those maps. For the herbs, and we'll probably spend a lot of time on this in the park, especially focused on salamanders. Um, this is going to be the biodiversity hotspot in the entire globe for salamanders. So if you want to break it down in the park, there's 40 species of salamanders, 13 frogs or, or toads. In Texas, there's 26 salamanders and 43 frogs or toads. So that doesn't sound super impressive at first, but start looking at it this way. Let's put it on a per area basis. The park is 816 square miles. Texas is 261,000 square miles. So species per square mile, the Smokies is at 0.05 for herbs. Texas is at 0 0.0003. And so the Smokies is 167 times more diverse on a per area basis. Than Texas is for these taxa. So that, that's one thing that makes up the salamander capital of the world. So we'll talk a lot about salamanders on the trip, spend a lot of time catching them, trying to figure out what the heck they are. They're difficult to ID, but it's kind of fun. So some of them we'll see here is the imitator salamander. And there's two big groups of salamanders we'll look at a lot the Desmagnathus or the Duskies and the Plethodon. They're both lungless salamanders. And see how big and muscly the back legs are compared to the small, narrow front legs. You start looking for that to tell you it's in that Desmondathus genus. So that's something you start picking up on. But you know, look at the range maps we just saw on those warblers. Huge, right? Look at the range map on this salamander. That's just several counties in two states, and that's it. And that's that's not really an accurate range map. The real range map wouldn't be everywhere within that range, but you know, depending on the habitat, it would only be in certain elevational bands within those few counties. Um, so. The imitator salamander is kind of hard to ID because we have the great cheeked and the red cheeked salamanders. Um, the red cheeked is also called Jordan salamander and it imitates them. So you never quite know which one you have until you get one that's like right on type. Here's a Jordan salamander. Um, and this is in that plethodon group. See how both back and front legs are you know, long and skinny looking? So that'll tell you it's in that plethodon group. But look at the range map there. Now it's in three or four states. Pretty limited range. Here's the pygmy salamander again, four states, but you know, that's just one county in South Carolina. Uh, when I was at Clemson, Clemson's you know, right in here somewhere. We went and hiked up the highest mountain in South Carolina. I feel like the Sassafras Mountain, I might have that wrong. But you stood on top of the highest mountain in South Carolina and all you saw were taller mountains because you were looking across the border into North Carolina. So 
Um, but yeah, we'll see lots of cool, interesting salamanders. And we'll see lots of evidence of different disturbances. So when we go to Abrams Falls uh, one day in near Cates Cove, we can see the evidence of this tornado that hit now 11 years ago. But basically it was an EF4 tornado. This was the day the South got hit with just hundreds of tornadoes. This is one that hit um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama and like killed the punter's girlfriend on their football team and a bunch of other people. So um, this one was, you know, 166 to 200 mile an hour winds, took out 4,500 acres of forest and it cut a swath a quarter mile wide and 17 miles long. And you can see some of the destruction on the ground there. Look at the aerial infantry before, after. So you can see what the tornado did on the aerial infantry. Okay, you should appear right about now. I don't think they used drones to get that quick. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, just remarkable the amount of damage that did. And then another big one we'll talk about is a couple of kids were hopping along the uh, chimney tops trails in 2016 in November and they just started lighting stuff on fire for fun. And then, yeah, wind picked up a few days later, then they suddenly got like 70 to 100 mile an hour winds in November, which is weird. All the leaves are on the ground, it's dry. They, they do have a November fire season. And that ended up like killing 16 people and burning down like 2,500 buildings in Gallagher. So that was November, 2016. We were there for this class in July, 2017. So not even a year later, and it was amazing how much stuff they had already rebuilt in Gallagher. <clears throat> they had torn down damaged buildings. It wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. But there were still whole hillsides you could see that were burned up. But I think it burned over 10,000 acres in the park. And there's some pretty cool ecology with Table Mountain Pine and Mountain Laurel with how those ecosystems work. But, so there's an example of you know, a human-caused disturbance. But on the, on the converse of this, they've been suppressing fire in the park since it became a national park in 1934. And that's completely changed whole ecosystems. They call it mesification, where what once would have been dry ecosystems dominated by frequent low intensity fires. Now they have these litter layers that are so thick, the litter layers have so much fuel in them, you can't burn them today because it would just burn way too hot. And it's completely changing the composition of the forests. They used to have red cockaded woodpeckers, an endangered species in part of the park. But as soon as they got fire out of those ecosystems, the mid story grew up and they disappeared. Which I think students on this trip are probably glad of because you hear a lot about RCW scares. Probably don't want more there. <clears throat> but as the stands recover from natural disturbance, you see all sorts of cool different things playing out. Like there, there's questions like, is the sugar maple a late successional species? And you see Acer Sahara sugar maple. It, it's dominant, you know, years after this disturbance. But is it really late successional? Because it was here the whole time. You know, it was there from the initiation of the disturbance. Some things like yellow poplar, this figure shows it crashing out after about 100 years. We're going to see stands in the park where that yellow poplar does not drop out. They can live for a long time and they can get huge. Uh, we'll see six foot BBH yellow poplars in places. So pretty remarkable to see a tree that big in the eastern US. And then other disturbances in the park, kind of hard to tell with this grayscale, but those dark black areas, those are concentrated settlements. So the park was just formed in 1934, not even 100 years ago. And before there, this wasn't a park. People were living there. Um, this dotted area, see that? Over here, uh, our campground, Big Creek, will be up here. That says uh, corporate logging. So they had companies in there logging. Uh, this cross-hatched area is big trees with diffuse disturbances over here. And then high inversion forest attributes is a lot of the area here in the eastern part of the park. So that was less impact. Uh, but, you know, ballpark estimate, maybe two thirds of the park has been logged or heavily impacted uh, prior to it becoming a park. The other thing that they've also done that doesn't show up on this, they dam, they put in a dam right here. <clears throat> and so now there's a kind of lake right here. So there's a big reservoir bounding the south side of the park. And so I've, I've done some hikes. This is a pretty remote part of the park over here. You can get in at Fontana Dam, but unless you take a boat, you can get into areas right around here that are about 16 miles from any trailhead. But then you'll be hiking down here and there will be a cemetery with like plastic flowers. And the Park Service, when they built the reservoir, you know, 50, 60 years ago, agreed to vote, you know, the people who had loved ones buried in the cemetery over a couple times a year. They'll put plastic flowers on their gravestones and clean them up and stuff. So there's all sorts of human activity, even in some remote places. 
This is what some of the logging went through. A lot of the trails you walk on in the park, they're nice and gradual and you know, pretty easy to hike on. And it's because they're old tram lines. They log the park by rail. And so they put rails in places you wouldn't believe they put rails in, but they did. And you know, they pulled out a lot of American chestnut, yellow poplar, just massive, huge trees. Um, that same hike I saw the cemeteries on, I'm walking around in what I think is a really remote part of the park. And then I see like out of the trees, like giant brick structures, like derelict old abandoned buildings that are huge. And you're like, what the heck is that? We, I stumbled on this old logging town called Proctor. And they had over a thousand people living there in the 1920s. They had a movie theater, they had schools, you know, they had everything a small town has. And that town, the sawmill industry there, harvested more than 200 million board feet of timber out of what was mostly the park. So, and now zero people live there. Like it's completely gone other than the, the mountains. And then you have more modern disturbances. You put nine, 10 million people in their cars from a mountainous area, they have major ozone issues. Um, so ozone is what, O3? And so it's reactive and you don't wanna breathe it in. And where it really gets bad is UV light. So high elevations with lots of UV light and warm temperatures. So in the summer with lots of cars, uh, they'll get ozone accumulating at higher elevations. Sometimes the weather service will issue like a health warning, like don't be outside. Uh, but on the vegetation, you see it forming in dark spots like on that yellow poplar leaf. So um, it's not as bad as it used to be because they control what goes into gasoline more and more. And then you have what comes out of emissions more and more controlled on vehicles, but it is still an issue there. <clears throat> so that's more of a modern disturbance. And then there's lots of invasive species issues. <clears throat> so I talked about princess tree during a dendro lecture for those who had dendro. Uh, but it's it's a real bad invasive tree in the park. The Park Service actually uses herbicides and other treatments, and they do a pretty good job controlling a lot of the herbaceous vegetation. So in the park, you don't see a bunch of silk tree or other invasives. Then you go outside of the park, and they're all over the place. You know, so. um, they're also getting hit with a number of invasive insects. The hemlock woolly adelgid really started having impacts in the early 2000s, and by now it's wiped out about 80% of the eastern hemlock in the park. And they're seeing like the mountain world that grows under it. It's becoming much more abundant, kind of changing those ecosystems a lot. But that's what it looks like if you see it on those books. <laughs> and of course, the chestnut blight had a major impact on the park. So American chestnut would have been a dominant species there. Obviously, when we just saw they did log a bunch of it out, but it's a great stump sprouter. It would have all come back. But then the blight hit the park shortly after it became a park and you know, took out all of them. So now they're there, it's just stone sprouts, you know, small sapling sized trees. There's none of these big, huge old ones. It used to be called the, the redwood of the east, but no more. <clears throat> yeah. I'm not fully adulting. <laughs> yeah. So here's a shot from Cleveland Stone, the highest point in the park. And there's a bunch of dead, Frazier firs that were killed by that hemlock. Or there, there's another one up here, balsam woolly adelgid, that I didn't mention. Balsam woolly adelgid is not a lot of this back. But. So here's spruce fir forest at really high elevations. That's Shining Rock, called a forest outcrop in Kiska National Forest. But above 5,000 feet, you'll run into red spruce. I see a Rubens, and above probably 5,500 feet, maybe you start picking up some Frazier firs. So firs and spruce are not trees you see anywhere here on campus. We don't have any. It's way too high. So. But they're some of the most abundant trees on the planet, not those species, but spruces and firs in general. <clears throat> so there's Fraser fir, there's red spruce. Uh, they've got cool little cones on them. And uh, Fraser fir, it's one of the country's most popular Christmas trees. So, you know, you can buy those around here sometimes in December. Is that the one that you chose for the I've mentioned that probably on Doug fir, but that does have exerted racks that do kind of look like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, Fraser fir and balsam fir, very hard to tell apart. Uh, but balsam fir is found further up north. We won't see balsam fir in the park. But Fraser fir has these exerted bracts sticking out. Yeah, it can kind of look like a tail tail. We'll see a bunch of hobble bush in those ecosystems and others. On the left there, it's a viburnum, pretty flowers. And then they have um, <clears throat> herbaceous species like some members of the Rivies genus. There's Appalachian gooseberry. And then we were there a few years ago. Some of you probably know Eamon Thurman, Birdman. 
he's working at grad school now. I was just messing with him. I thought, saw what I thought was a crow and I was like, he's like, oh, there's a crow. I was like, no, that's a raven, Amen. I was just totally messing with him. But then we looked it up and if you look at the range map for ravens, they have ravens there. <laughs> so you can find ravens there. It's sort of the Southern extent in the Southeastern United States at high elevation right there. So, um, and it's year round too. So if you see a really big crow there, up near the spruce fir, you may have some ravens. Uh, here's all sided fly catchers. Again, it's that same range map we'll see over and over again. And then there's some unique mammals at high elevation too. Um, anytime you see firs and spruces, you can start picking up uh, red squirrels on the right. And you usually hear them before you see them. They really alert when people or predators are around, so they start chirping. So uh, they're not a hunter's favorite squirrel up in the north. It's, they alert all the other wildlife. There's a hunter nearby. And then around here in your wildlife classes, you all are dealing with eastern wood rats. And if you see something similar up there, you can see it's going to be the Allegheny wood rat. So a different but similar looking species. And then they have redback voles. So some of the mammals are having those same range maps we've been seeing on the birds. And then I'll get into it a little more later, but they have this unique fusion where you have the northern flying squirrel here, the southern flying squirrel here, and then their ranges overlap. And then there's an endangered species, the Carolina northern flying squirrel, that you can find in the Smokies and near the Smokies. Another ecosystem type, usually at high elevation, are grassy voles. And so I won't get into a ton of detail on these. We'll get into a lot more detail on the trip on them, but they're a pretty cool, unique ecosystem with a lot of sort of ecological questions surrounding them. That's uh, Andrew's ball we'll go hike to. Hopefully it'll look like that with no rain. There's a grassy ball in the foreground with a heat ball in the background. We'll talk about heat balls in a minute, but that's in a shiny rock wilderness in Pisgah. And they've got grass species as you would expect. So there's a mountain oak grass, wavy hair grass. They've got all sorts of herbaceous species like wild strawberries, dwarf sinkfoils. And if you look at the map, here's where the grassy balls are found. And so uh, this Tennessee, North Carolina border right here, if you put a line like right here and then follow the Tennessee, North Carolina border the rest of the way through the park, that's the Appalachian Trail that pretty much follows on the border. And then Mount Sterling right here is what we'll hike the very last day of the trip. And we're gonna be camped out right about there. So a little bit north of it. So you can see there's a lot of grassy balls. They're all at high elevation. The, the spine of the Blue Ridge runs to the middle of the park there on that Tennessee, North Carolina border. So they're all found pretty much at high elevation. Heath balds, the word heath, it means like blueberries, azaleas, uh, rhododendrons, mountain laurel, those sort of shrubby evergreen for the most part species. They're all in the heath family, which is the Ericaceae. And so a heath bald, um, that's the Appalachian Trail. I think I took this picture on Thunderhead Mountain near Cades Cove. Um, but this Heath ball, you're walking through it, and it's like head high shrubs. So you can't see under anything at all. Then occasionally there'll be like a big rock. You can stand on it, poke your head up above and get like the mountain view. So hard to see through them sometimes. But some of the, the, the species, I mean, they're beautiful. We're not gonna be there when they're in peak bloom or anything, but they have flame azalea, rhododendron calendulaceum that's native there with real pretty orange flowers. And they've bred this species and a lot of the azaleas that they like plant around campus here. So it, it's bred into a lot of the cultivars that we have today. Different rhododendrons, like that Catawba rhododendron with real showy pink flowers. Lots of interesting little herbaceous plants we'll be able to take a look at when we're there. And then with the heath balds, they all tend to be more prevalent. You can see that shaded line in these bar graphs is percent of total part heath bald area. They all tend to fall to the north side. So again, south side more sun, north side less sun. There's some differences there where they're sort of structuring where you find those ecosystems. So you find them a lot more on the north side of the main range of the mountains than you do on the south side. And so there's some more images of what they kind of look like. And with those, you know, it's kind of early successional habitat with both the heath and the grassy bulbs, you know. So you have high elevation, early successional habitat, which is kind of unique. And so you'll get all these taxa that are found, you know, associated with those. We can usually see like dark-eyed juncos up at high elevation. So that's one bird species that's pretty we commonly observe up there. Then you drop a little lower, you get red oak forest, high elevation red oak. And this red oak is Quercus rubra, northern red oak. 
So it is not our southern red oak that we learned in Dendro here. And it's got that real stripy bark that makes ID pretty easy. Kind of looks like a big shoe mark. So that, that's one of the most valuable timber species in the southern Appalachian Mountains. It's kind of their cherry bark over there. And then there will be mountain hollies that don't look like what we think a holly should look like at all. World blue stripe is a common herbaceous plant. You see a lot of jewel weed in some of these ecosystems. And they have pretty nice fall color. They have a lot of American beach. So we're going to see a lot of American beach there. It'll grow up to elevations of 4,000 feet. So here we find it here and there around our SMDs, and that's kind of it. It'll be all over the place. And then we'll get into some of these other species that we haven't seen around here at all. Yellow birch, that's one where you scratch the twigs and it smells like wintergreen mint. Um, yellow buckeye, and you don't want to eat the fruits off those, they're toxic. We learned red buckeye around here, and it's a shrub that's usually this high. Those things will be five feet BBH and 120 feet tall. They're huge trees. Looks like someone's glued potato chips to the bark. It's got a real funky looking bark. And then they have striped maple. This is usually a popular one. The bark is green and white striped. That also goes by goosefoot, moosefoot. It's got a bunch of other common names, but that's an understory species. We'll see false and true Solomon seal. They're in different families now, I believe. And then there's the Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel on the upper left that I was showing you. You'll find them up in spruce fir forests also. They actually hunt for like trucks. And so, <clears throat> but lots of diverse wildlife. We'll look at with each of these ecosystems. Um, we'll go to the Carolina Nature Center one day to see taxa that we're less likely to see out in the wild, like hellbenders. And one thing they have there is the least weasel. So the smallest living carnivora. And look at the range map. It only makes it as far south as the Southern Appalachians there. And uh, what does the world's smallest weed carnivora, the world's smallest weasel like to eat? Mice. It likes to bite through mice skulls. So it finds something smaller to eat. They'll have acidic cone forests. This, these photos I took in Albright Nature Grove, I think like 2005. A lot of those hemlock are dead now. Um, but you know, we'll get to see a lot of these hemlock dom dominated stands, old growth forests. So there's Eastern hemlock, yellow poplar, you'll find the, those in these areas. And uh, hemlock's the tallest trees in the Mississippi. The tallest ones that have been found are 180 something feet in the park um, is where they've been found. But the guy climbing on Will Blows and got to the top and they were already dead. Belgian are already killed. So but that's our tallest eastern tree. <clears throat> we'll see Fraser magnolia, which looks kind of like big leaf magnolia. It's got huge leaves. Um, and then all sorts of different ferns like Christmas fern. And you can find Christmas fern around here too. So there's some overlap green ash, white ash, white oak. You know, there's a fair bit of overlap between the vegetation here and there as well, especially at lower elevations. Chestnut oak forest, this, the leaves look just like swamp chestnut oak, except this is found on the xeric site. So look at this ridge. See how dry that looks? The vegetation is all these scrubby oaks. So we'll see some of those oak dominated areas, table mountain pine. That's what chestnut oak looks like. But it's got that real rough bark. So very rough bark. Huckleberries, pine saps. So here's what a pine oak heath forest looks like. There's a lot of trails where you're hiking through like a tunnel of rhododendron. Like the trails just completely enveloped in that big shrub. And then they have a number of different pine species there we don't see around here, pitch pine, table mountain pine. So we'll get some new pine species. There's table, or there in Virginia pine's a common one, pretty crappy form. The needles are always in twos and they're twisted together. So that makes IDing that one easy. There's pitch pine. It's a pine that can re sprout if it's some sprout. So it's kind of weird for a pine. And there's table mountain pine. That's the one I've earned the cones on. We'll see sour wood. You can chew on the leaves, they're real sour. So that's a funky ID feature. Otherwise, it kind of looks like uh, black gum a little bit. Um, Pipsisawa also goes right wrapping. So some interesting herbaceous plants. And again, there's that Carolina Northern Flying Squirrel. Look at the range map on that now. They're not even showing whole counties, they're just showing a few little disjunct populations. Um, and again, these things, we've worked with them and we've radio them and treated them on some of these trips, but we've never seen one because they're nocturnal. So you'd have to go out at night and be way up in the mountains. They're only mostly at pretty high elevation. So I think one year on the trip, that's Western North Carolina right here. I think the Rhode Islands is probably right about here. We're all the way up to the Rhode Islands to go looking for them. And then they have holes bored into the trees that the different conservation agencies have put in habitats like they put woodpecker boxes in around here. And so you can see those, you know, you call them a tree too and look at, oh, it's in the tree, but we haven't seen them. 
Salamanders, just lots and lots of different species. Um, we've definitely caught red cheeks on the trip. I don't think we've seen a Junaluska. We've caught a few Santillas. We've definitely caught secret salamanders. And I don't know if we found a Yonaha Lassi. Uh, we might when we went down with Caleb Hickman to the Cherokee, um, Cherokee, North Carolina, down at the, the Koala Boundary, which is, they don't have a reservation. They've got that boundary. So. And then black bears. I guess Addison isn't here. Um, Worried about black bears, but estimate is between a thousand and two thousand. So they just say fifteen hundred. They don't really know. It's really hard to get a population estimate for these in really rough terrain. But there are a lot of black bears. We've seen them every trip, so we've never had trouble finding them. And so there's no honey allowed anywhere in the parks. You can't shoot bears in the park. Uh, the park service does occasionally, but only if they've harmed a person. But really, bear management is people management. So here's why you don't want to pet a black bear. Uh-huh. Tennessee jails aren't as posh as Southeast Texas jails. So yeah, probably wouldn't want to go for that. So not supposed to go within 50 yards. That's true for elk too. So we can get a little close to them, but not a lot close. Usually when we see bears in the park, we're in the van and they're like 10 feet away. They're usually pretty close when we end up seeing them. So if you're in the van, it's fine. Uh, there's not much risk there. The average female only weighs 120 pounds. The big males can make it up to three, 400 pounds, maybe a little more in the park, but it's not like they're going to be coming through the, the door of the van or anything. <clears throat> so that's a little bit more of an introduction to the ecosystems in the park. So any, any questions on any of that, anything? Good. Do we need to bring tents? Yes, unless you want to sleep outside. <laughs> yeah, and I'll send you an equipment list. I've got a detailed equipment list. And then usually I work with Campus Rec and they'll rent you gear for even cheaper. Um, a couple of the trips, we barely got rained on at all. Two of the trips, we got rained on a lot. So it's, it's hit or miss. Uh, but, you know, even if stuff goes wrong, we're about 30 minutes from a wall. So it's not the end of the world if stuff goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, we'll have two more meetings. We'll have one where you all do the presentations. And we can split that up into two meetings if we need, depending on uh, how many people end up paying the deposit. But I'll set up those for after the deposit's paid. So we have presentations from the group that's really probably going on the trip. And then we'll have one meeting I'll probably try and schedule in late April where we'll go over any camping logistics, gear logistics, any questions you all have with that. Um, and then we'll also go over what food you all want. We'll set up the food and whatever everybody wants. So, yeah. And then the camping on these, it's pretty similar to like the Sylvan Strip, same trailer, same gear. So a lot of that stuff we use on Sylvan's and Sylvan Strip gear. So. Yeah, and then just a reminder on the deposit, do the front desk and the forestry building cash check or card. They'll take any, and if, based on the number we've had, express interest, I think the trip will make this year, but if it doesn't, that'll be included in the budget. So, yeah. And then the last thing I wanted to go over is um, the presentation assignment on the back of the syllabus. I put the rubric on there for you. Uh, very similar to those who had me in Dendro. You can see it's structured pretty similar to that Dendro rubric where you can see, you know, what you want to focus on giving the talk. Notice it's designed for a 12 minute presentation. So your grade is highest if it's between 11 and 13 minutes. So that's what you're shooting for. And then on the other side of that, or on the page before, if you got the one weird one, um, there's some options for topics, but you don't have to pick from one of these. So any topic that's relevant to the trip is fair game for presentation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And one person per topic. So if you know what you want now, you can just let me know or you can email me. <coughs> Yeah, so those, those are some ideas for topics. Yeah, sure. Alligators. Oh, not on the list. Not on the list. What if I do one over a salamander and then I buy the salamander, bring the salamander to class and let people pet the salamander? I don't think you can buy most of these. If you want to do a salamander, do a hellbender. That's the most interesting one, Eastern hellbender. I did that. Okay. There's an Ozark hellbender too, up on Arkansas. So, yeah. I think the only salamanders bigger than the hellbender, there's maybe one in Japan and one in China, and some of those can make five feet long. Those are the world's largest. But what this would is... you do if I showed up at class with a live hellbender? Probably call the game warden <laughs> because I'm assuming you would have violated CITES. 
<laughs> well, what if I legally bought? I don't think you can legally buy Hellbenders. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I mean, check with your presentation. I think they're on the the Endangered Species Act. Okay, probably not. <laughs> yeah, they may not. They may not be listed. Don't quote me on that. But if not, they're close to being listed. Yeah, they're they're at the very least threatened. Yeah, and honestly, with the help and preserved ones and live ones, it probably look pretty similar. Yeah. It looks like a hellbender looks like your big toe after you've taken the longest bath of your life. That's what a hellbender looks like. <laughs> yeah. But it's a salamander that can draw blood on a human biting one. Yeah. They're unlikely to take a digit off, but they can, they can do a little bit of damage. They are in the creeks in the park, but we'd have to spend like whole days looking for them and we had to mess up whether we found them for sure or not. So we don't invest that much time in those, but we can definitely see one at the Western North Carolina Nature Center and they've got it in a tank where the tank's mounted off the wall and it's glass top and bottom because it's usually under something, but you can get it in the tank and look and find it. So, yeah. But yeah, just let me know and you know, there's no deadline on when you want to let me know when the presentation is. I'll send out another Google poll, but it'll probably be this time slot this work for most people but we'll plan on maybe a late march or early april on the presentations so there's plenty of lead time on that and then late april on the logistics oh my god i know there's a little alligator looking thing Elbenders? yeah yeah well, they're like a wrinkled alligator yeah. welcome <laughs>